with Dr. Jonathan Reyes. He's the Executive Director of Justice, Peace, and Human Development for the U.S. Bishops. Welcome, Dr. Reyes. Thank you, Father. Great to be here. Now, you speak at a lot of these FOCUS conferences. Uh, you've been a v VP at FOCUS. And I think one of your, your great themes I've heard you speak on is the new evangelization. Can you describe what that is, what that means? For me, um, I think there's a common line that people use about new ardor and new methods, and I think certainly that's part of the new evangelization. But I, as a historian, one of the things I note is that when there's an act of new evangelization, when something else is needed, the Lord also creates special institutions to do it, movements, mm -hmm. your order, uh, the Dominicans. The institutional form of evangelization emerges, and focus is just one of those. It's mm -hmm. in itself a ministry that's acting in a particular way forming people in a particular way. So it's more than just preaching the gospel creatively, using new techniques. It's actually about creating places where Christians come together and form communities that can do evangelization as well. Mm -hmm. So I think that's one of the things we're seeing in the new evangelization is more lay organizations, institutions forming for the sake of the new evangelization. And that's what's so exciting about Focus and why I'm not surprised by its growth. Right, and do you think I've heard some Europeans say they, they look to America for hope in this area. Do you think it is a special charism that Americans have to start these institutions to involve the lay people? I think in one sense, yes, a certain kind of apostolic institution. Uh, the United States has a very much a history of sort of a certain kind of revivalistic energy in it, both in its Protestant and Catholic manifestations, and I think that's just true. Uh, there are also movements that, have found, that come to us from Europe and Latin America, some mm -hmm. of the ecclesial movements. So I think it's just a different way in which the Holy Spirit's working in certain dynamics. Mm -hmm. But in terms of that dynamic preaching of the gospel, apostolic energy, there is, my friends from around the world too, say there's mm -hmm. something pretty unique here in the United States. And what role do the youth play in that? Obviously, they're the future of the church. <laughs> uh, they're also winsome. Mm -hmm. I would also note this though, I think our youth are at the front of the the uh, fight for Christian identity. Uh, they're the ones most under attack. They're growing up in an age in which they haven't necessarily been raised Christian, which it's new in the United States. And so they're at the forefront of the new evangelization, culturally in a particular way, because of the way that culture in the United States has gone. That the Christian assumptions we used to have, they didn't grow up with those. So they have a particular mission uh, to witness to their friends that there's a better way. And this is more than talking, it's how they live. Mm -hmm. And what makes Focus somewhat unique is it invests in how people live together, the joy of the Christian life lived well, and counts on that being the witness, as well as using Bible studies and preaching the gospel more directly. Right. It does seem to be God's providence to you. I mean, I guess historically you could speak to this too, how young people are often engines of social change and in God's providence, he's using young people, raising them up to witness to a culture that's fascinated with the youth and perceive liberties of youth and things. And these people are going after the gospel with that. It's an eloquent witness today. Isn't it, it is. Yeah. And people, particularly in sociology, want to use youth as a barometer and say, we know what the future looks like because all these youth are leaving the church and the, the rising number of nuns and all that. And so there's this really quite potent counter witness right. when they see young people who actually love the faith that generations before them have slowly been right. relinquishing in many cases. And so it's a testimony that if you're going to use the youth as a barometer, you need to see this as well, not just the large studies that say youth are less engaged religiously, less mm -hmm. engaged politically, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, sociology doesn't tell the whole story, but there are some people who want to read it that way. Right. I know I'm witness to by the young people uh, their generosity and their freedom. And definitely they need the wisdom of the older generation. Correct, yeah. They need prudence right, and guidance right. and all that. But as we get older, it's like we hold on to our stuff and our positions and things more. And they seem to have this freedom of just to go and say and do. You know? That's the gift of yeah. youth, isn't it? Right? They can make <laughs> yeah. decisions that right. those who are 20 years older say, you know, that I wouldn't necessarily make that decision. Right. <laughs> so they have a capacity for sort of radical zeal, yeah. which is always the gift of mm -hmm. the youth in the church. Mm -hmm. And as you say, the wisdom of the church resides in those who are older and those who have been around, and mm -hmm. prudence is gained by experience. But we need that kind of energy. Uh, and that kind of energy that's not in somehow a rebellion against that right. which has proceeded, 
but is a re-engagement with the deepest streams of our tradition mm -hmm. and the faith that, frankly, there are so many people who've survived the last 40 years of secularization mm -hmm. still in the church mm -hmm. and loving Christ, and they've got something to teach, right. young people as well. Right. Um, I like your point, too, about the young, uh, the people on the margins, the vulnerable people, the ones that are suffering maybe most intensely from this secular culture, and they have suffered the results of the sexual revolution. So they, they're looking for a better way. Right? Yeah, it's hard to imagine them needing more freedom in that area. Yeah, like what, yeah. what aren't they allowed to do? Right. So it's almost like they're at the end of the experiment saying, mm -hmm. hey, there's nothing more to be promised here. We've right. seen what this looks like and it doesn't bring joy. Yeah. Uh, young people aren't convinced by words. Mm -hmm. They're convinced by living joy and they can spot phonies. So it's when they encounter a way of life that genuinely brings joy and answers their deepest longings, mm -hmm. they fall in love with it. And I think empty promises are genuinely empty for them in a way that maybe they were more exciting 20 years ago, 30 years ago. And I, I think too, if the church can just offer young people a view of marriage and a place where marriage is lived, that just, that's written in our nature that you know, young people just want that. You know, even if the culture is telling them to live a different way, there's still something in them that wants faithful, committed love, that wants a family. And isn't that a big part of the new evangelization that, hey, we have this? I think you're right. I mean, the studies would show, and there have been numerous of them, I can't think of off the top of my head, but that young people still, what do they desire most in life, mm -hmm. more than money, career, success, is a successful marriage. Mm -hmm. The challenge is when you ask how many of them actually believe that it's possible to have a successful marriage. Right. And so I think. The church has to both continue to articulate what it is to be married, but we need more and more healthy marriages as witnesses simply of hope. Mm -hmm. You can have this life. Right. Uh, and that's not an easy thing to do, but it's the essential witness. We need right. young people to actually believe this is possible. Right. To not just long for it like some sort of dream, mm -hmm. but to think, I really can have committed love. Mm -hmm. Because we're made for committed love. Mm -hmm. And we long for it, but they need to see it. Right. Let's talk about Pope Francis. Uh, Pope or Saint John Paul coined the phrase "new evangelization." Pope Francis has really given it some energy. What has he brought to the equation? You know, my favorite <laughs> word. People ask this. My favorite word of Pope Francis is the Spanish word "encuentro," mm. which in English means encounter, but the two words mean something different. Mm. And this will get to your question, which is, in Spanish, "encuentro" means the kind of encounter where people are really communicating. Mm -hmm. It's more like Newman's sharing of soul, cor ad cor mm -hmm. it's a real connection. And if you listen to Pope Francis over and over and over again, he says we need to build a culture of encuentro. And I think what he's brought to this vision of the new evangelization is what it's about in part is the healing, the bringing together of human beings in genuine encounter with one another, mm -hmm. encounter with the poor, encounter with your family, we can't keep treating people like transactions, mm -hmm. or we can't just treat them as though we have a brief interaction. When we say encounter English, mm -hmm. you can encounter someone on the street accidentally. In Spanish, it's a deliberate taking them seriously. So when people talk about Pope Francis's gestures, when he mm -hmm. touches the deformed young man, mm -hmm. or when he kisses the head of the, uh, he's actually connecting in a way that mm -hmm. I think we all long for. Right. Um, our culture has got such broken relationships. Yeah. And he's saying part of the new evangelization is genuine encounter with Christ, with one another, and with Christ in one another. Right. And I think the youth are resonating with this. Mm -hmm. He's not just saying serve poor people. He's mm -hmm. saying have relationship with those who are on the margins. Right. right. Affirm their dignity when you meet yeah. them. Yeah. And there's a, there's a difference in that. There's a way to, you know, I've been in this charitable world for a while. Mm -hmm. There's a way you can give something away. There's a way you can actually encounter someone when you provide a service or yeah. when you do something with them and for them. And they're completely different. Right. And I think that's what people are catching in Pope Francis. Yeah. I heard uh, one blogger was writing. She was kind of frustrated that uh, she felt like, okay, now we have one more thing to do, <laughs> you know, is to encounter poor people or whatever. What does that look like, you think, for a single person, a married person, uh, this encounter that he wants us to do? I think, uh, you know, Mother Teresa had a great line. When uh, someone came to her and was sort of taken by her work and said, 
I want to change the world, Mother. What should I do? Mm -hmm. And she said, go home and love your family. Mm -hmm. In other words, take the opportunity for genuine encounter with the other right. in their need. We're all walking wounded. We're all poor. Mm -hmm. That's the mm -hmm. point. Uh, that we start with the relationships that are closest to us right. and we make those right. I think this is connected to the year of mercy, by the way. At the heart of mercy is reconciliation. Mm -hmm. And I think this year there might be special grace, I hope there's special grace, mm -hmm. for all of us who are carrying those relationships where there hasn't been reconciliation. And the ability to have a genuine encounter with sometimes people close to us, mm -hmm. that's where we start. Because if you can't live it in your home, you can't take it onto the street, you can't do it there's got to uh, be another way, isn't there? Yeah. <laughs> <Just kidding. laughs> no, and it's the hardest thing, right? Yeah, you're exactly right. This is this is asking us to go to where it's most difficult. Yeah. And I think what happens too is people, other people outside of the family will plug into that. You know, you build they some community. They see it, yeah, they want it, and they start coming over. You can invite them over, reach out to them in some way. And that is, I mean, we hear that time and time again from the missionaries here. They provide some kind of community on campus that the young people want. People want community. Yeah, yeah in our individualistic mm -hmm. age, they want to be connected. Mm -hmm. And I think you're, this is what Pope Francis is saying, what culture of encounter is. Mm -hmm. It actually pushes against that sort of individualism that runs off, yeah. does its own thing, yeah. and actually is quite lonely. Right. You know, both Benedict, Pope Benedict and Mother Teresa said the greatest poverty in the world mm -hmm. is isolation. Right. And this is what we're trying to heal. Particularly I mean, in the West, where right. there's plenty of material goods. And there's something about reaching out to the marginalized, maybe just the unpleasant personality, the difficult person. But it seemed like, I mean, that's what love demands, but it also seemed like it fires up the love in the community, it makes it real, that it's not just special friendships or just the most beautiful people. Yeah, no, yeah. relationships of convenience don't, yeah. ex don't demand a whole lot of love, do they? Right. And right. so this is precisely what it's doing. Go to those who have been forgotten. Uh, and we have them in the States, by the way. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are a lot of people who we don't know exist in our cities, sometimes in our neighborhoods, who are completely isolated and alone, mm -hmm. and we don't see them. They're invisible to us. And we need to find them. Mm -hmm. They're there. I think sometimes people think, I have to go overseas to serve mm -hmm. people in need or people who are isolated, and it's just not true. They're, they're all around us. Mm -hmm. And so part of it's opening our eyes to say to God, Lord, show me where I can have an encounter. Show me the people I don't see. Open mm -hmm. my eyes to this. Yeah. And it seemed like, too, uh, the challenge today, I, I think, is like our, our changing technology and how much the culture is just continually changing with, you know, with the computers and the social media and all this kind of stuff. And it's like we're trying to build a Christian culture to handle this. And we can't keep up. It's like something new every year that's maybe assaulting our faith or... Um, what about navigating that? I mean, we want to reach out to people, but it's not enough just to text them a, a message with smiley faces or something. But uh, how do we use all that in a good way? That's, I mean, that's a million dollar question. <laughs> yeah. uh, but it, doesn't, it does seem to be simply true that technological engagement can't replace human, human interaction. Right. It can't replace, there's something to the actual presence of other human beings, mm -hmm. the physical, energy, warmth, all that, that's just a reality. Yeah. You cannot yeah. replace that. So as we think wisely, and critically, and creatively about the opportunities of new technology, we can't lose, mm -hmm. we can't lose human touch. This is Pope Francis, he's always talking about touch, which is mm -hmm. very interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, he said at one point in a speech he gave in Argentina, when you were in this pilgrimage, it was after pilgrimage, and you handed money to that poor person, did you touch them? Mm -hmm. And did you look them in the eye? Because if you didn't touch them and look them in the eye, he says, you haven't had an encounter. Hmm. All you've done is toss them some coins. And I think he right. was deliberately referring to scripture right. at that point. Right. So maybe we could use the technology to set up the encounter to make Set it. up the encounter. It can certainly <laughs> great for information. It's certainly yeah. a way to keep in touch. We're on the move. That's just right. different. Mm -hmm. The notion of the old neighborhood is gone. Families are no longer in the same city. So there's a, there's a gain here. But if we act that that somehow replaces the genuine human interaction, I think we're losing far more than we gain. Mm -hmm. Pope Francis has said he wants a, a church for the poor that is poor or something along those lines. That scares church us. Church that is poor yeah, and is for, for the, the poor. poor. Yeah. 
That scares us as Americans. <laughs> what does he mean by that? <laughs> uh, well, I do want to say quite clearly that when Pope Francis says poor, he doesn't just mean spiritual poverty. I mean, I think mm -hmm. he really does mean yeah. we have too much stuff. Mm -hmm. And I think most of us, certainly of a certain class in the United States, yeah. would just concede that. Mm -hmm. um, we, at a certain point, you don't need a third shed in your backyard. <laughs> you really don't. You know, what is in there anyway, you know? Uh, having said that, I think in taking his inspiration from Francis, who you know better than I, it's interesting to me that when Francis, in his own testament, spoke of his own conversion, he didn't refer to the moment when he took all his garments off and said to his father, I give everything, everything I have, I'm giving back to you. He talked about when he encountered lepers, that that was the moment of his encounter with God's mercy. And so I think there's a deeper piece here as well and this year of mercy is part of it in which to be a poor church is to encounter those who are most isolated and alone and to bring them into real relationship. Not just do something for them, mm -hmm. not just be nice to them, not support charities that support them, but actually bring them into human relationship. Mm -hmm. That's a poor church because the point is we're all poor. Uh, and it's in this healing of relationship that we actually become a church that's poor, recognize its own poverty, mm -hmm. and reaches out to those who are poor. We still gotta get rid of the sheds, though. <laughs> <laughs> you speak of, and scripture speaks of it, and many saints speak of us as in, in a Christian battle, or in a spiritual battle. Um, that might make some uncomfortable. How do you see it as a battle? Well, I mean, I just think our tradition's pretty solid on this, right. that to understand we have genuine spiritual enemies that St. Paul, this is St. Paul's language in Ephesians, that we fight not against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities. In fact, there's just a spiritual realm in which all kinds of things are being contested. There really are demons, there really are angels, there really is a devil, and Pope Francis has been quite frank about this, it's startling to some actually, how often he talks about the devil. To lose sight of that, I think, is to lose sight of the fundamental reality of the world we're in, and we can't lose that. Um, I think there's a temptation in a scientific, materialistic kind of age to just pretend that was myth or analogy, mm -hmm. but that's certainly not the way scripture or tradition or Pope Francis speak about it. So prayer is actually mm -hmm. doing spiritual warfare as well as intercession and adoration and all these other things. Mm -hmm. uh, that our preaching of the gospel is actually engaging in a struggle that includes the invisible world as well as the visible. And then sometimes the approach can be like, well, I'm just going to take parts of spirituality or religion that'll make my life kind of more comfortable or find some kind of peace. And it's a different sense than I'm in a battle trying to survive here and yeah. trying to protect my family from whatever and or my parish. And, and it resides yeah. in my own heart, right? Yeah. I mean, I do the very thing I do not wish to do, Paul says. Like, yeah. Yeah. If, if any of us isn't aware as we struggle to live the Christian life that there's some battle going interiorly in right. us, we're just right. not paying attention. Right. I think part of the reaction to it, though, is there's, a, there's an instinctive reaction, particularly these days, to associating religion with battle or war at all, mm -hmm. because obviously of global implications yeah. and the history of the church, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And I, I take that caution seriously. And so one of the things that I'd like to say over and over again is that the weapons of our warfare as Christians are love. It's right. the fundamental prayer in love. Right. Uh, so that this can't be sort of construed as some sort of militant right. Christianity right. that's mm -hmm actually uh, steps into realms that aren't Christian. Mm -hmm. So love's our weapon. It's a real war. It's a real battle. Yeah. But love will win it because Christ's love has already won. Right. And one last question. Uh, you said something very eloquent last night about the only way to lose basically is to give up, right? Let's just say that again, how you, how you said it last <laughs> night a little bit. The only way we lose the battle we're in is to take ourselves out of it. Right. Right. And to do that, we quit. Yeah. because. For Christians, the hero is the martyr, mm -hmm. the one who stands with Christ to the very end and gives his or her life. Yeah. Other battles, the goal is to kill the other person. Mm -hmm. In this particular battle, the goal is simply to stand to the end like Christ, mm -hmm. and then we'll be raised again. And so it's a whole different way of understanding. Right. We're the only ones who can separate ourselves from the love of Christ. Right. No one else can do that. The devil can't do that. No spiritual powers. And so we need to remember that even when we're discouraged, even when we sin, even when we think I'm not worthy, Lord, even when we think this is hopeless, that's just not true. If we stand to the end, we win. Just begin again. 
Begin again, as Saint, <laughs> yeah, as Saint Alphonsus Liguori yeah. said, if, try not to sin, but if you sin a hundred times in a day, repent a hundred times right. in a day. Right. Right. Well, thanks so much. Great, pleasure to be here. Thank you, Father.